timetable as to when the, the exam will be written. But what is important to highlight from this slide is the fact that uh, for grade 12s, the trial exams will be written, although we are saying that uh, the, the, the duration of the writing of these exams should uh, only be limited to a maximum of three weeks so that the grade 12s can also have enough time for revision between the writing of the trial exams and the starting of the examinations. And uh, the next uh, 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 slide is just about the next steps that will be taken from here. And uh, the next step, uh, uh, what you call a uh, slide, is just the process plan. Uh, what is it that will be done? So we have uh, included the fact that uh, uh, the subject plans that we are talking about will be disseminated to schools and uh, the fact that uh, uh, even the ATPs will also be reviewed. The next uh, slide. This is part B, as I indicated with part B, it is more about the revised NSC timetable. And uh, we just indicating, I think Mrs. Gaya has already covered us to say that uh, the exams which were scheduled to start on the 26th of October, 2020, they have now, uh, we have since revised that uh, such that the exams will now start on the 5th of uh, November, 2020. And uh, so that uh, the exams will now commence eight days post the scheduled date. And the next uh, slide. Uh, these are the dates that have already been uh, outlined by uh, Mrs. Geya. I'm not going to get into that. The marking, the release of the results, he has already spoken to that. And these are the key post writing activities, marking, standardization, approval meeting by Umalusi, the release of the results and the provisional release. So those are the dates. And uh, this is what we are recommending that the portfolio committee knows and discusses the, the presentation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dr. Maboya. Uh, Advocate Mister. Thank you, DG. Uh, good morning to the Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Members, DM, DG, and colleagues. Uh, DG, are you able to see the presentation? Yes, uh, Advocate, uh, it's on the screen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so the purpose of the presentation is to present the directions that were published on the 23rd of June, together with the amendments thereof uh, to the Portfolio Committee. Um, this particular slide, indi a slide indicates um, when the directions were published and the subsequent amendments to the directions were published. We also have a section on definitions in the directions, and um, most of the de de uh, definitions are aligned to the definitions in the various uh, legislation um, in respect of education. I will just focus on two definitions, and that is on official which means an employee appointed by the school governing body in terms of section 20, uh, subsection 4 and 5 of the SASA, a person defined as an officer in terms of section 1 of the SASA, an educator as defined under the Employment of Educators Act, and a person employed in terms of the Public Service Act or a person employed by a school board. Then we have a definition of third party, which means um, persons who do not fall under the definition of an official, but may access a school or offices, including but not limited to volunteer workers, persons appointed in terms of the expanded public works program and as a community development, uh, as, uh, as community development workers, food handlers, chief food handlers, parents of learners attending the school and persons delivering goods or prov providing services to the school. Um, the directions then also indicate the objectives thereof, 
and it is to provide for the arrangements for the phased return of education, educators, officials and learners to schools, hostels and offices. It also indicates that all schools, hostels and offices must comply with the different regulations published by COCTA as well as those uh, directions and circula circulars issued by the Minister of Employment and Labour and the Department of Public Service um, and Administration in relation to COVID-19. The collective agreement number one of 2020, which deals with the concession process to follow in respect of employees with a comorbidity and chapter H of the personnel administrative measures dealing with leave measures applica applicable to educators. It is also to ensure that there's a uniform approach as far as possible when it comes to the phased in return of learners. Um, the directions also has a scope and application and the um, directions apply to all schools, or hostels, offices, learners, officials, third parties as uh, defined, governing bodies and school boards. Um, then there is a clause on the entry to school premises um, and this is to ensure that um, the safety and hygiene social distancing requirements are adhered to so that no person other than a learner or official may enter a school premises or hostel unless such person obtains the permission of and makes arrangement with the principal or head of department in advance before entering the school premises or hostel. Then we have the phase return of learners table. I'm not going to go through this. This was already covered under the school calendar presentation. And of course, as we know, the only cohort of grades that are still to come in is on the 31st of August 2020. And those are grade five, grade eight and school for learners with severe intellectual disabilities. We've also made provisions for an MEC who cannot comply with the phased in approach to submit a report to the minister for concurrence. Um, or further determination um, within seven days of them coming to know that they are unable to comply with the phased return of, of school. Um, only we make it very clear in the uh, directions that only those schools that have complied with the minimum health, safety and social distancing measures may uh, open. Um, then we've also given a responsibility to the head of department to ensure continuously uh, that they monitor and evaluate the phase return in order to ensure that there is uh, a maintenance of the hygiene and safety standards and um, that the failure to meet the require, required minimum health and safety and social distancing measures uh, must be reported uh, every two weeks um, to the Department of Basic Education. Um, there is also a determination um, which requires that schools that do not meet the minimum health, safety and social distancing re requirements, uh, that there must be a plan that uh, needs to be formulated um, as, uh, that identifies the scope of the problem, the measures to be taken, as well as the challenges experienced. And it also requires for this plan to be communicated with parents and learners without delay. Um, then the head of department must also ensure that the schools continue to conduct um, assessment of learners and provide feedback uh, to uh, the learners. And this includes um, that um, the schools provide teaching and learning material um, to the learners and an equal responsibility on parents to ensure that the teaching and learning material are collected or accessed as per the arrangement with the school. Then, of course, uh, on the 2nd of August, we've made amendments again to the directions uh, to cater for the arrangements after the break. Um, again, there's a phased in approach and um, throughout the um, um, directions, we place emphasis that officials who are at school must ensure compliance with the health, safety and social distancing requirements and to assist with the distribution of learning materials and the rollout um, of the daily school feeding program for all qualifying learners. Um, that is the table. And as I've indicated, the last cohort of learners come in on the 31st of August. We also make it um, clear that the phased in approach applies, as well as um, the fact that if a school 
has um, applied for deviation um, or, or given the, the head of department uh, notice notification for deviation, it still applies and that um, during uh, the phased in approach after the break, the school must comply with the social distancing and timetable models. Um, we then talk to the school management team and um, this is more uh, of an administrative approach that the school management team must uh, exercise. Uh, that is to implement a rotational leave plan to ensure that the principal and each member of the school management team are allowed at least a five day break. And of course, other administrative uh, processes that uh, the school management team must consider. Um, then we, uh, the, the direction refers to school attendance and it indicates that where a parent, caregiver or a designated family member chooses not to send a learner to school for, re for reasons that may include any medical condition of the learner, including comorbidities, anxiety and fe uh, fear related to COVID-19, including concern for family members over the age of 60 or concern for family members with comorbidities, a preference for the learner receiving learning and teaching instruction through online or virtual platforms provided by an independent institution, which is not related to the school that the child is registered at, and a preference for the learning um, for the learner receiving learning and teaching instruction through an online or virtual platform provided by the school, or an application for home education and deregistration of a learner from the school. Now, in the in the case of um, A, B, and C, um, the uh, parent of the learner must apply for uh, exemption from compulsory school learning, and the slides hereafter indicate how that must be done. With regards to a preference uh, for the learner receiving learning and teaching instruction through the online platforms provided by the school, um, application for exemption from compulsory learning is not required. However, an application for home education must be done in accordance with Section 51 of the SASA. Um, this then all uh, deals with school attendance, which I have uh, summarized. Then um, we talk about a uh, new insertion that was um, placed in uh, the administrating of application for um, exemption. And here we indicate that where a, a parent of a learner has applied for exemption and the head of department has not yet considered the, the application for exemption, that the child will be uh, considered as exempted from uh, compulsory school attendance. And it also indicates that the head of department must consider and finalize the application for exemption within 30 days. Um, then there's a new clause inserted six capital B, the registration status of learner and marking of attendance register. And this particular provision makes it clear that uh, where a learner is not physically present at school, that learner will be marked absent in uh, the attendance register. However, it is incumbent on the school to maintain records of all learners who are unable to attend school for reasons uh, contemplated in Direction 5-7 and all exemptions granted in terms of Direction seven, uh, 6. Sorry. Um, and then we um, have an insertion of an application for deviation from the phased return of learners and officials to school. Again, a school may only be permitted to deviate if they have complied with the minimum health, safety and social distancing measures and requirements. Um, and then they will notify the, the head of department by filling in uh, certain forms and making a declaration um, to apply for the deviation. Uh, so then we have uh, learners with special educational needs. Um, this particular uh, provision uh, is going to be uh, or direction is going to be uh, amended. Uh, we have engaged in a settlement um, agreement which was made uh, an order of court on the 4th of August and um, because uh, it was felt that the directions do not adequately cover the issue of uh, learners with special educational needs. As you can see, uh, the current direction talks to autistic learners and learners who are blind, partially sighted or deaf. Um, the new amendment will also cover uh, learners with physical disabilities, intellectual disabilities, epilepsy and severe to profound intellectual disabilities. It will also address the ready readiness of special school hostels uh, for learners um, with special education needs. Um, so 
we also make a provision uh, to ensure that um, the, the provincial education department provides uh, the following uh, personal protective equipment to learners with visual and hearing impairments. That is, face shields must be provided to blind learners, cloth face masks must be provided to low vision learners, teachers and support staff, and face shields must be provided to learners, support staff and learners in schools for the deaf. Um, then we, there's a provision on the opening of school hostels and then again, this is um, required and this must be done so long as the hostel complies with the minimum health, safety and social distancing measures uh, and requirements for COVID-19. Um, then we have uh, directions on the May, June and November, December examination. And this uh, basically indicates that the main June examination will be administered in November and December and clarifies that the ne uh, November, December national senior certificate examination will be administered as planned. There's a direction on the issuing of permits and certificates. And again, um, this was uh, relevant under alert level uh, three under alert level two, uh, permits and certificates are not required. We have um, a direction on the general safety measures at schools, uh, hostels and offices for the duration of the national state of, the, uh, of disaster. And again, the provincial education uh, department is responsible for the procurement of personal protective uh, equipment. We have added uh, amendments there to clarify that it is the principal through the district office um, that must ensure uh, that they um, communicate their procurement needs to the Provincial uh, Department of Education. And um, the Provincial uh, Department of Education must ensure uh, that the procurement is done timely. Um, then we have a section on a symptom and screening. And uh, this requires that all person entering any school premises, hostel or office must be screened at the entrance. It also requires that all persons who conduct screening must receive the relevant training. Um, we then have a provision on sanitizers, disinfectants and masks. And we say that there must be sufficient quantity of hand sanitizers that, that must be provided. They must have at least a 70% alcohol uh, base and um, that uh, work surfaces that are touched frequently by many people must be cleaned uh, frequently. It also provides that every provincial department of education must provide each official and learner with two cloth face masks or face shields as required. Then we have a provision on uh, social distancing and timetabling models. Um, here we say that every school, hostel or office must comply with the social distancing requirements of at least 1.5 meters. We also have the requirement uh, that um, ensures compliance with the health, safety and social distancing requirements uh, that school facilities must operate at 50% or less of their capacity at any given time. And then we provide um, the different timetabling models uh, that may be utilized. Now there is also going to be um, an amendment to this particular uh, direction. And um, the amendment is um, regarding uh, the 50 persons requirement in terms of a gathering. As we know, that requirement comes from the regulations of COCTA, but it is not necessarily um, applicable to schools uh, because um, attending school is not a public gathering. However, there seems to be confusion in the sector and hence um, it called for the particular amendment. And the amendment just clarifies that uh, a school that has a large enough facility, such as a school hall, may accommodate more than 50 per persons in that facility at a time, strictly for education purposes, provided that all health, safety and social distancing requirements Um, we have also a direction on the annual financial statements. This was to provide for the situation where schools were not able to submit their annual financial statements at the end of March, and um, they could then do so. There was an extension till the 31st of July. And um, then, of course, the, the, the technical um, 
provision for the withdrawal of the previous direction so that this directions become applicable and then the short title and commencement. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Honourable Chair and Honourable Members, uh, I'll now take the last presentation. Uh, Chair, what I want to indicate is that there's a lot that we need to present to the Portfolio Committee, and I want to humbly submit that uh, we could present next week on the first when we're presenting the state of the reopening of schools, which will be in detail. We'll also be presenting what happened uh, this week, uh, activities up to Friday this week, and we'll also be including issues that related to planning for receiving 10 million learners that the Honourable uh, Portfolio Committee could consider uh, allowing us to present that item together with the draft amendments for learners with special education needs that advocate on the implementation of the National School Nutrition Program, which uh, we uh, provided during the school break, but also give uh, an update of what happened uh, this week. So the honorable members could consider that request at the end of uh, this presentation and discussions, whether they would allow us to present those three. What I can commit is that we can do all three within an hour as we're going to try and do with this one. Now, the purpose of this presentation is to try and interpret uh, how basic education is following the movement of the country from one level to the other. The World Health Organization um, a few days ago indicated that COVID-19 has imposed a, uh, a risk for every daily basis. We really need to calculate and uh, work out the costs uh, as to what are the implications of your actions and your decisions based on the environment that you find yourself uh, in. When the president uh, addressed the nation about uh, the country moving to alert level two, uh, one of the announcements uh, was that uh, people are now allowed, visits are no longer restricted. But uh, given the fact that uh, we're still operating under an environment of COVID-19, we have to make a determination as to uh, where do we visit, who do we visit, how long are we going to take, and what are the activities that we're going to engage in. Similarly, in basic education, we are expected to follow uh, the same in working out the risks under which uh, education has to be provided. The introduction here a simple summarize of the COVID-19 pandemic or demonstrate next week when we uh, present. Did you? We are losing open. you a bit. Yeah, it might be connectivity, Chair. Uh, I hope you still hear me. Yes, we, I can hear you now. Yeah, it, it's connectivity. Some areas are fetchy in terms of connectivity. So the introduction clearly summarizes uh, uh, one of those uh, factors that are attributable to the closure of schools, that when you close schools, the likelihood is that your dropout rate is going to increase, you are going to experience uh, early unwanted pregnancies, et cetera, and et cetera. And we're beginning to pick that up. The report next week will, will really provide more details on that. Can move to the next slide. And we, we simply, uh, using the statistics provided by health as a, a precursor to indicate where schools are located. You know, so far, the, the I mean, up to the 23rd, which was Sunday, uh, test the uh, number of people who tested, were tested, uh, the number of positive cases, number of recovery. Move to the next slide. 
What I must indicate here, the, the, the good news is that uh, we recall that the Western Cape used to be high on the, on the um, uh, grid of the assessment. Uh, Western Cape is still the highest in terms of fatality rate fo followed by Eastern Cape. Uh, but it has dropped uh, to number three. Last week when we presented to a meeting of uh, district directors, Western Cape was still number one. It has now dropped to number three. You can see that Gauteng is number two, highest case load, um, but also Gauteng is, is among the highest in terms of recovery and so on, uh, and therefore followed by because at the Honorable McKenzie wanted to know what is the difference between what was sent this morning and what was uh, uh, sent uh, uh, last week. Last week, we had not updated the slides up to yesterday. You will appreciate that the slide that we dealt with, we got it from yesterday because these figures are updated on a daily basis. This is the curve that people have been talking about, the notion of flattening the curve. Uh, honorable members will appreciate that Gauteng, as I've indicated, as the highest case load. But you can see that we have gone past the peak. You can look at it in all provinces experience the peak at different times. For instance, the Western Cape was the first one to go up, which is in yellow, uh, you can see, and then the rest of the other provinces followed. Gauteng had the highest followed by KZN, and then uh, you can see the Eastern Cape. Um, uh, and then you can also see following closely among the, the big uh, uh, four provinces, and then apart from uh, there is northwest there, and before northwest, I've said it's free state, and then up and then northern Cape lying right at the bottom there before the unknown. So that is the curve. You can see that provinces experience the peak at different times. And what is important for us is that uh, many a times when restrictions are removed, there is a resurgence or an upset, and there is a likelihood that the peak might come back again. Uh, if we don't adhere to non social distancing, if we don't strictly adhere to those things, we are likely to experience the second wave like it happened in 1918, as I will show in the, in the, in the last slide. And these are cumulative uh, cases per province. I'm not going to take much of your time there. And you can see at the adjusted differentiated approach is what we follow uh, From the country, the country adopted the New Zealand model, and uh, we moved to level four, and we moved to level three, and every level is described. Right. You can see level level five is the ultimate. It means there that uh, your health facilities are unable to cope at all. The virus uh, um, um, uh, spread is quite is quite uh, uh, very high, and then you can see that uh, as you go up, the readiness of the health facilities. That's why when the president announced the level two, he said we've got more beds. There's more space in your casualty unit. The field uh, uh, health facilities like in, the, in, in Cape Town and here in Johannesburg, have been decommissioned uh, because of, uh, you know, the reduced number of the cases of the infection, and therefore uh, meaning that 
that uh, we've uh, gone past the peak. We are uh, experiencing the peak early. Uh, would, would, would also remember that at some point we were told that the peak would come around May, June, and at some point we were told that it would come around September, October. It now happened between those projected dates in terms of the models that were um, uh, that were used to predict the peak. And as I've said in other uh, meetings when I presented, or use uh, scientific tools to do your modeling. Uh, these tools are based on human movement, which is a very complicated uh, variable that we are dealing with. And that's why, you know, um, 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 uh, anticipating this with the greatest precision is always a challenge. You can see then, Chair, that the, the area with the lowest infection will be called a vigilance uh, level. The one following that is called emerging hotspot, which is on your right. And then the third one is hotspot. And then the highest is called the high risk hotspot. The six metros are deemed to still be under high risk hotspot. You see where the schools, where the learners, where the educators are located in this uh, big picture of uh, you know, the prevalence of the virus. We can move quickly. Next slide. And this is when the country was at alert level four, and learners, because of their importance, it's right at the bottom there in red, and the rest of the grades would still be remaining at home. At level four, we could be allowed grade uh, 12 and grade seven, but we delayed that, we only brought it at alert level three, as you can see. At alert level three, we would be allowed to bring even those grades in terms of our planning. At alert level two, we can bring all grades. The only thing that still remains are teachers with comorbidities and learners. Everyone can come on board, including learners and teachers, comorbidities because the prevalence of the virus would be so just teachers with teas and learners with uh, comorbidities the next slide uh, the next slide just shows when at alert level three um, and this is how we have planned to face grades uh, taking all these factors into account Next slide, level two, as we all know, and uh, as I've just explained, uh, in terms of the planning of the phasing approach of uh, uh, grades and schooling, uh, we're going to bring all the grades uh, in. And uh, hopefully when we move to alert level one, uh, teachers and learners with comorbidities would also be uh, allowed. Uh, we have nationally both uh, in terms of public and, uh, and as the deputy minister and I also repeated uh, this morning, 13.1 uh, million uh, uh, learners, uh, deputy minister in all and you can see that they are broken down in terms of the grades that are indicated there. Um, uh, 640,000 uh, grade 12 learners who are full-time, but plus part-time learners and uh, those under senior certificate who are supposed to have written in June, it take us to over a million learners, 1.1 million learners, uh, who we are supposed to prepare for for the exams uh, that we uh, starting in November, as Dr. Maboya indicated. And we have taken all of these factors into account because social distancing will have to apply during exams. We source uh, information on extra uh, venues for writing exams, venues for marking, and marking will not longer be 10 days, it's now going to be 15 days, 
to accommodate all these numbers that we see here. Can move to the next slide. And this is the breakdown nationally. You can see that uh, uh, the schools that are on vigilance level, which are in green, emerging hotspot nationally, uh, the second group and the second group are hotspots, and you do have uh, high risk there. The good thing is that you use for planning, planning to provide some psychosocial support. You also use this in some countries like Sweden. They never close their schools during uh, COVID-19. Never close their schools, never close their uh, early learning centers. And their prevalence rate of the virus and their death rate is not higher than the point which is supported by medical and scientific evidence around the vulnerability of learners and also the propensity of learners to carry the virus from one learner to the other. Next slide. Uh, this is Eastern Cape, uh, uh, Honorable King. I know that you're quite passionate uh, with the Eastern Cape. Your Achilles Hills in the Eastern Cape are your Buffalo City. Um, and, and I think the next slides will, will just share some very interesting information around the number of um, uh, COVID cases as well as the, um, the death rate or the fatality rate, and that is the spread of the Eastern Cape. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, you've got uh, those schools under vigilance, uh, under imaging hotspot, under hotspot, but also under high risk and uh, occasioned, of course, by the BCM, which is the provincial capital, This is, which is where the provincial capital is. Nelson Mandela Bay is the economic hub of the province of the Eastern Cape. There's lots of human movement, which uh, increases the, uh, the infection rate. And I think with adherence to the non-pharmaceutical uh, interventions that I've referred to, uh, it has helped to reduce the infection rate in the Eastern Cape. It has drastically reduced, and we hope to even get the death rate to also reduce, because under Buffalo City, you, it's Can move to the next slide. It's free state, free state. Uh, at, um, Honorable Makesi, your 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 um, um, your your uh, 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 area of focus in the free state uh, is Mangau Metro, um, and also has the highest uh, death rate, as well as Lijeli Putra, as you'd see in the next slide. And this is the distribution of uh, both learners, uh, educators, and different categories of schools. You can see you've got a great number under vigilance. Area. Uh, I should also indicate, I'm sure, the MEC in the Northern Cape who traveled the whole province uh, to prepare for the reopening of schools. We've also lost uh, a number of senior officials, both in Gauteng and, and, and Free State. Uh, and the MEC and the HOD of the Free State uh, are recovering very soon. So that's the Free State. State, and we can move to the next one. I'm almost done, uh, Chair. This is Gauteng. Uh, Gauteng, as I said, is the highest case load. Gauteng, as the province, is an integrated region. As we can see, um, that under vigilance, we just, uh, probably between um, uh, uh, the four big provinces, uh, uh, Gauteng, Western Cape, uh, KZN, and, and Eastern Cape. You can see under high risk, you can see that's where Gauteng is. 
And uh, Johannesburg is a district, the Tswani district, City Bank, Ranfontein is a sub district, Lisset, and Ekuruleni as sub districts are uh, areas of focus there or the epicenter of Gauteng. Uh, we can move, and we do understand there's a high human movement because of being the commercial and the economic hub of the country. KZN, um, under KZN, we can see the number of schools and um, what is uh, of uh, focus uh, and surrounding areas. Uh, King Tetrao district, uh, as well as Rikwal. One of those flashpoints for, for education where we have seen high cases uh, of uh, COVID-19. We can move to Limpopo, which is the next slide. Uh, Limpopo, uh, very few, you can see, I mean, the picture is beginning to clear. And Honorable Murat Setla, you'll be happy to learn that Capricorn, um, they used to be uh, a threat around uh, the mines in Sikukune. And thanks to uh, the mining companies that subjected all mine workers to testing, they've been able to contain the spread in those areas. And there's been an increase in the Capricorn uh, district given the fact that uh, that's where the provincial capital is and there's high human movement there. The next slide, Bumalanga. Um, Honorable Suela, you'll be pleased to know that uh, there's a drastic departure uh, from Lipo, Limpopo and Bumalanga compared to the other four big provinces, including the free state. I mean, in Pumalanga, you don't have anything under hotspot. You don't have anything under high risk uh, hotspot. There would be no reason, really, for us to close. Guys are strictly adhered to. Uh, last week, uh, Emalatheni was the main area that experienced an increase. But uh, since then, the picture has shifted to Gangala. Uh, as well as Katsibande, which are the districts that are experiencing a high caseload in Bumalanga. But overall, the picture is quite uh, uh, quite clear in Bumalanga. Those smallest provinces, um, Pixley, uh, Kaseme, uh, Chair, you'd be happy to learn that the provincial capital doesn't seem to be the epicenter as yet, as well as Uppington, uh, but uh, Pixley Kaseme, uh, a district is the one that seems to be the epicenter of the Northern Cape. The, uh, there will be a decrease in the infections in the Northern Cape. Northwest, the last but one province, well, with, with Northwest, uh, again, the pattern continues uh, similar to the Popo and Pumalanga. You can see that it's only vigilance and imaging hotspot and the district. Uh, Matrosani as a sub district is an, is an area of concern. In a lady, Freiburg areas, it's an area of concern. Honorable Adunes, where the two of us come from Magwasi Hill sub-district is an area of consent. I'm happy to learn that you are now in Cape Town, maybe you are safer. Uh, Mahikeng, as well as JV Max are also areas of concern. The last slide here is uh, Western Cape. Uh, Western Cape has really moved uh, uh, from being the highest in the country to now being the first province to uh, indicate a decrease in the infections, but still very high on fatality rate. And the areas there uh, of concern are back, Kailisha, uh, Cape Wildlands, Overbeck, West Coast, Beaufort West, West Asequa, and uh, Mosel Bay. Those are the main areas uh, 
that are still experiencing uh, quite a very high uh, uh, level of infection. About what happened in 1918 during the avian uh, flu in Spain. We are told that the second wave was the government has relaxed restrictions at school level. We are going to make sure that the non-pharmaceutical interventions of wearing masks, of uh, basic hygiene, of washing hands regularly using sanitizers, disinfectants to clean the environment and the facilities and the places, as well as keeping to social distancing are at yet to. We are in a process of reviewing the 1.5 meters for younger children, but there is a team from DBE that looks at the medical evidence as well as the research and it's a matter from the University of Stellenbosch, Bosch, who's a member of the Ministerial Advisory Committee, giving us some of the latest information about younger children, that younger children don't need to wear masks all the time. And the other issue about the virus being airborne, it's in the interest actually of all learners during the course of the day to take off the mask and uh, move it like that, that to create more ventilation and but also to open windows. Nancy um, has reviewed uh, the issue of the 1.5 meters. We're likely to move it to one meter. Countries vary. Uh, and the UK is two meters. In other countries, it's one meter. We're going to make sure is that our decisions will be informed by medical evidence, by the research that is available. Well, and the opinion that we get from the Ministerial Advisory Committee. Chair, thank you very much for indulging us. We are done. Thank you very much, um, DG, and uh, thank you very much to all the, the officials that presented. Um, honorable members, those are the presentations as asked um, from DPE. I have a request from Honorable Sukars that she would want to leave the meeting early. I would therefore then um, allow her to speak first um, so that she, she is able to, to leave. And then um, I've noted uh, Honorable Machesi and Honorable King um, that also wants to speak. I don't know if there are other hands, honorable members. Honorable Machavela. Honorable Machavela. Also Boshov. Honorable Boshov. Tembequayo. Honorable Tembequayo. Honorable Murwatsetsa. In that order, then, um, honorable advance. Honorable advance. In that order, then I will give over to Honorable Sukars. Thank you. Yeah. I am leaving my video um, off just because the um, internet connection is is a bit unstable. Um, I want to thank the department for um, for their presentation. I just have um, a few questions. The one is that the the biggest concern um, that we have is the reported um, um, problems that parents are having in keeping their children at home and letting them learn rather in the safety of their of their homes. And I now looked at the um, presentation made by the department that presents, uh, parents need to do application. And I, I just need the department to, to really re-emphasize 
recognize what their position is because we received many complaints from parents who says feel that their children are not um, um, they would rather want their children at home it's not safe and secondly, because there are concerns either with people living with comorbidities or just in general, anxiety and fear and feeling that my child is not safe. Now, it is very important that the department or see the presentation by um, followed an uh, administrative process that will frustrate parents and in the end force them to get to get to send their children um, back to school. So I would like the the, um, the department just to respond to that. That's number one. And then um, secondly, um, Chair, there, there has also come concerns where um, parents have a, an issue with, with, with schools where safety standards are not um, um, being adhered to in some schools. But I have to also compliment um, some schools in our areas that I know of that has opened with 100% um, no problems um, um, yesterday and where children are at school. I have to say that. So when I speak about safety, I'm not saying it, uh, using it as an example. I'm just wanting the department to take note of places where they, where schools are having issues with, with um, safety adherence. There was a picture put out on Facebook where a school had a, um, an event. Um, I, I, I forget what it was called, but I think it was a, a, um, some kind of orientation Presentation. And this was used to um, to emphasize by a group that one schools to safety standards at schools are very important because we need schools to stay open and not to give in um, or to give um, um, uh, motivation for for people that really want to disrupt schools, especially in poorer areas. Then, um, where learners with disabilities does not return to school, in slide number thirty eight. The head of the department must make all reasonable efforts to ensure that the learner is provided with appropriate learning and teaching support material and so forth. Do these directions apply to learners from special care centers too? And if not, what provisions? And I think I've asked this question last week as well. Is the DBE making for the continued learning and therapeutic support for these learners using the conditional grant outreach team? Then last. Chair, I just want to know with the matriculants that miss um, that are that that is not registered um, for, to write exams. What is what can be done for those children? Can they go back to the schools where they were registered at so that they can write? Um, and if children does not want to write exams this year, um, are the, is there provision made for them for the middle of next year for them to write? Right. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, good morning to everyone. And I also I would like to thank the department for the presentation uh, that they've just uh, that they've just yeah. given to us. I, I just want to find out: Will uh, the DBE uh, be um, you know, these are the areas that, uh, you know, uh, are faced with COVID and this is how you're going to go about it. So does it mean that you're going to use um, a risk uh, differentiated approach, the risk adjustment that um, the, the minister is going to be talking, talking about? Because I'm not sure now, given the fact that, you know, the, the COVID-19 cases are going down and especially like if you look at provinces that have very low um, I think you know at the beginning we should have actually uh, considered that and now I don't see how that uh, slowly our cases are, 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 are being reduced or you know they are, they're going down throughout the country so uh, what is the idea or the reasoning behind, you know, using the risk uh, adjustment approach now? Because I think 
uh, going forward from the beginning because there were provinces like Limpopo that hardly continue behind now of using this approach uh, given the fact that cases are going down. And also, will be uh, will the DBE be publishing structural plan that outlines the support of both DBE and provision education department, which will offer schools to facilitate remote learning to ensure that support is, is provided across all provinces. So, in case that you have um, learners who who those who say that like, look, I want to stay at home, I want to, I don't want to go to school. Uh, the minister it has come out and said that you know they they're going to be sending she's going to be sending books schools must be sending books and that hasn't happened and that is not happening uh, and now that like you know all the schools are going back next week all the learners are going back next week uh, what is going to happen now? and also um, is there any plans that the department has has to ensure that there's some kind of a catch-up, um, uh, what do you call it, a, a catch-up program for those learners. First of all, those who just don't go back to school, and the fact that we haven't, uh, they haven't been receiving any educational learning because they've been staying at home, uh, which means that you know they're going to be left behind. Are we going to compromise on the curriculum? What are the plans of uh, of the department to ensure that there is some kind of catch up process that uh, that is uh, has been put in place? Uh, the, the, okay, there's also the belief now that is, uh, is coming out that like you know schools mustn't be closed. Period. Whether uh, the cases are going up and the cases are going down. Uh, schools must stay uh, open. What is the, the department's view on that? Uh, and also, um, are you communicating with the private schools? I'm sure you are. I just want to find out what is their experience in terms of the number of uh, cases that uh, they are seeing? Because given the fact that learners back at school, uh, uh, education has been going on uh, continuously, um, ensuring that you know they, you know they, they, are, they are practicing uh, social distancing and uh, sanitizing hands and all that. What are their cases? Because that could actually inform us in terms of saying, like, if you have um, the resources, because in the Eastern Cape, for instance, there was a, a school that used uh, sanitizers that was below seventy percent. Uh, and also, you know, there, there are other challenges that we are seeing uh, throughout uh, the country. Um, so I just want to find out what is, you know, their view. Have they seen cases or they haven't? And also, you know, what are our cases in terms of the, the, the learners and teachers who have contracted the virus? Do you have any of that data available? And also, uh, teachers that uh, have to be replaced within the system. Uh, do we have anything that needs to be, uh, you know, uh, replaced because of uh, um, severe commodity, uh, commod commod comorbidities? What what has happened with the department? Are we are we going ahead, you know, to and how many? I would like to know the figures. How many teachers have been replaced up to so far? And is any arrangement that you've made to ensure that, uh, given the fact that, you know, we have got our teachers are going to be still marching continuously from March, from, from, from January up to March, what arrangements have you made to ensure that, you know, there is schooling, uh, teaching and learning in a classroom? Because now that means we are going to... So what plans do you have? Okay. Some of the MECs um, could apply, that could not comply to social distancing, can apply to um, open later. Um, I would just like to know which schools actually had that challenge, which provinces had that challenge, and how um, have they sorted all of that challenges out during the break um, that they were given. 
Also, um, how many schools still remain closed due to structural challenges and which provinces are mostly affected um, by this? Um, also, the directive that was given to um, substitute educators. I've noticed that in the Eastern Cape, only this coming Friday, a directive went out to say that they need um, teacher assistance for 7,000 Rand. Um, and if you look at the time frame, they had a whole break to, to, to sort all that issues out. And yet the Eastern Cape only decided to sort it out. Yes, and like Honorable Machesi said previously, it would have been nice if we could have had um, an indication of which um, provinces still need educators, how many is needed, what has been done to bring in those teachers already on the FUNSA bursary scheme, but have not been placed. I've also seen that, that my concern was also raised uh, a few weeks ago, that in the Gauteng province, uh, parents who would actually want to register their children for full um, homeschooling are having major difficulties. Um, so my question would basically be, are there any specific offices um, at the department itself that deal with all of this? So what is it they've been trying um, for four to five months? So if we can also look at that, um, would it help assist us greatly? Um, when we look at special needs learners, you have been mentioning that support was given on the support material, uh, assistive devices, and therapeutic services. Well, I spoke to some of uh, Blind SA's um, people. They are not really happy because they have not really seen any assistance coming from from the department, and they feel that most of the special needs schools um, have been put on the sideline um, to receive any assistance. So if we could get a detailed um, analysis of what actually happened, when were they assisted, how were they assisted, which schools was assisted, it would actually greatly help us to make a, an assertive um, analysis of actually, yes, there was support given, no, there were not support given. The multi-year approach on the curriculum coverage that will be going in into 2021. Was the, co the curriculum actually covered two foot into 2021? To write the exam. Also of concern to me is when you look at the grade 11s, uh, where it says they will only be writing elective tests. for them to progress then over to grade 12s. It would really then set these grade 12s back tremendously. So if we can get a proper detailed plan of how those grade 12s will be, it would really be helpful for us to see that these grade 11s will not be um, put on the back foot when it comes to completing a proper grade 12 um, assessment next year. What we've seen, um, I've had dealing with various schools. What I've done is I've had some of your the sanitizers um, tested. And we are actually making them sicker with some of the chemicals that are in those um, hand sanitizers. And I've asked a parliamentary question. And the answer I received was just a generic thing that they're using alcohol, 70% of all of that. But with everyone just jumping on the bandwagon to supply and sanitizers, I am afraid that we have actually compromised the quality for quantity so that people can just get a tender. So I would like to know what directive, proper directive, actually went out to the suppliers so that they provide proper hand sanitation and not at the end of the day, a long-term effect where kids will develop asthma or other um, skin uh, disorders because of the sanitizers that is being used. And lastly, what I have not seen in all of the documents that was presented, we recently had a court case on the full school feeding scheme. No directive 
um, is being mentioned on how the department itself um, send, uh, told, spoken to MECs in order to ensure that the school feeding scheme is going ahead and that they regularly update the courts on what is going on. So I would like to know where are those directives from the department itself, but also the directives that MECs then send out to um, the schools. Thank you. Honorable Masabela. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, for the matric class of 2020, what preparatory work has been done with institutions of higher learning to ensure that the late release of results in February 2021 will not inconvenience students' enrollment? Then the second question, uh, Chairperson, what measures are being put in place to support learners, particularly those in matric, whose schools do not comply with COVID-19 regulations and therefore closed, and the kids cannot access online education. And again, Chairperson, the presentation titled the direction, I think on page 10, if I'm not wrong, where, where it deals with entry to school premises. We know for a fact that most schools, uh, especially in townships and rural areas, are poorly equipped and do not have the necessary leadership and resources to deal with COVID-19. Why then should parents and the media be banned from conducting inspection visits to ascertain the condition of these schools. Will this not be of those schools by the department? And again, lastly, uh, uh, what was the reason? behind allowing private schools to open the quality of education provision in the country. Not only that, most public schools in the Western Cape applied to exemption from this phase to return and have been providing classes to children for a, a very long time. While children in other provinces like Limpopo, Mpumalanga, KZN, Eastern K have been at home, what implications will this have on the education system as a whole? Why is the Western Cape allowed to operate as if it is not part of, of South Africa? Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thanks for acknowledging the Western Cape. Honorable Poso. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Uh, with all the uh, possible uh, data and to uh, uh, not just to, to collect it, but to um, work it into information which can be used for the phase in approach and i think that is uh, very important but uh, i just have one question which was not covered by uh, what some of the other speakers have said the learners are due to be presented with the report cards on that very same day that means that we are actually not really, uh, if I understand correctly, looking at the number of days for schooling, which is presented in the uh, presentation, because when do the uh, uh, when they leave school for the, uh, for the little bit of holiday that they are going to have? Maybe uh, I understood something incorrectly, or maybe it could just be cleared up. Thank you, Chair. Honorable Dr. Tambekwai. Thank you, uh, Chairperson. Uh, my first question is based on the fact that um, 
uh, it was mentioned that uh, if we move to all schools, um, I mean all educators, irrespective of their comorbidity situation, would be asked to report to school. Yes, we ask with their district directors who presently are disapproving their application. have submitted all documents thus far. I am referring to the Northern Cape province, the district of Francis Bart, under the director of uh, El, El Muniera. I just would like to, to have a clarity thereof. Uh, the question two, uh, it's mentioned that uh, 10 millions uh, of, um, I think it's learners or what, 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 reported to school to I just would like to, to know that uh, have a, a clear indication or a report during the, the next week in connection with curriculum trimming, the revised annual teaching plans. I just would like to ask if there's a situation where there is a or a learner testing positive say it happens every week in in one and the same school which obviously means that the normal uh, uh, teaching or, or, or is not possible to take place there uh, what then uh, how are they accommodated in this? Say, for an example, that particular school is in a rural, rural area where only possible online type of uh, education uh, cannot be used. And uh, by, by it leads us to the three roads or what we call scenarios, the no roads to the high road. Why can't we have I mean, the, the, the other one, I don't know what is it, but there's something that starts with the road. My, my question is, why don't we start with no road rather than starting with the first road to the high road? Since the more than 80% of disruptions taking place in their schools, so a need for the first uh, column uh, should be implemented, and we call it no road, if it's possible, of course. And then the following question is based on home. Uh, should the parents continue paying the school fund and? Uh, if they are supposed to pay the, the, the school fund, which portion is that? Because their learners are not at school. The following question is about the staff that provides screenings at school. Who is paying them? Is it DBE or, or, or public, uh, what do you call that, public office? Yeah, uh, the reason why I'm asking this is there are some other staff that are hired specifically for the purpose of the screening who haven't received any stipend uh, by now. So who do we refer the problem? And the DM specifically? follow-up questions um, about the non-payment of pensions specifically to um, Ms. Travis case it's very much complicated because it has got different scenarios 
meetings where uh, educators had just to receive uh, that thing, the, the um, checks and sign on, on those papers, which obviously means because she is asked to provide pay slips for that period during the 80s, during the era of, of, of Buputatswana, which is impossible for her to do that. And she's also asked to appear in GEPF offices who are supposed to do this work. So I'm just requesting uh, DM, please, and, and DG, please attend to this case ASAP. No educator can stay for 10 months without uh, receiving their uh, pension payouts. But the last time, the last one is about the proposal that I sent to you, DG, uh, from the centers, ECB centers of Dr. Kenneth expected to, to, to reopen also, but they are an NPO and it only gets a funding from the, the parents. So they are asking whether they, they can't get a finance from DPE so that they can be able to pay stipend uh, to their staff and also buy some PPEs and general uh, fin finances. I didn't get a response from you, uh, DJ. Okay. Honorable Murata. Good morning. And to all honorable members in the house. Uh, <coughs> For starters, let us welcome. Let me join those who have already taken the lead in welcoming and appreciating the presentations from the department as led by the deputy minister. It was very clear. And uh, to me, the presentations were more of information sharing than of uh, raising a lot of uh, debates in any case. Though it is true, there would always be items which might warrant some clarity here and there. I think we must also point out, Chairperson, that uh, um, credit should uh, continue to be given to the department for the uh, ability uh, to adapt to the ongoing changes. Um, it's, it's not an easy job. I, 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 I sometimes sit down uh, humanly so and feel pity for them. Will be able to be equal to the task. You see, their ability to adapt to all form of risk adjustments with regard to the curriculum, the date of reopenings, planning, et cetera, et cetera. It calls for the uh, zeal and the efforts to rise to that very level. Uh, uh, DG, as a leader in the factotum, we commend you for spending sleepless nights to keep on presenting something factual as you did and you do today. Uh, yes, man, there is this issue of um, the school calendar. Can it just be amplified and be cleared up, you see, because when you say the school calendar runs until the 15th of December, then I think the DG, you, you owe it to us to unpack it. What do you mean? You see, those my predecessors, some of them, like Honorable Boshoff, has indicated, what does that really mean? Uh, is this the day for learners and the parents to collect their report forms? Or uh, what is this? The school calendar ends in December. 
the 15th. Can it be unpacked so that in the end, if it is not going to be unpacked, you'll find out that it is going to put an undue pressure on those who are responsible for all schools. Can it be well unpacked? We are the first people to understand it before any person can understand it. Number two, us have agreed that the issue from home is neither here nor there. That should be the bottom line, honorable chairperson. And if it is true that educators with comorbidities cannot make it by teaching from home. Then what comes next is uh, the substitute educators. There are many factors which will serve as a deterrent for those teachers to teach successfully from home, because it would mean they will have to offer lessons electronically. Challenges and the availability of gadgets, it is just not going to to work. And because it is not going to work, initially when we addressed this issue, uh, um, we were presented with an option of getting substitute educators who will fill in in those vacancies where educators with comorbidities will not be able to do their day-to-day -day work. Can we get an update if this is still feasible? Because I can see that uh, get it. If it is no longer feasible, affordable, uh, we know for certain you will be bringing the between educators with comorbidities and substitute educators. Again, on the issue of comorbidities, uh, I've got a practical scenario before me. Uh, last time I indicated that I'm sitting in the district command council in my area, Mobani East. Um, I've got a privileged information every time they report. Um, you, you, you see, there is a contradiction here, whereby it appears the department needs more information, which some of the doctors are not prepared to divulge. And of course, doctors will always operate under the premise of the doctor patient confidentiality. So if you demand more from such a doctor, Hide behind and say some of the things I may not tell. Okay, the practical reality and scenario here is in Mupan, 166 applications were granted concession, and 18 are still in progress in the office of the HOD. 103 returned for more details. This is the report that comes from the Department of Education. 103 returned for more details is the one which doctors are saying, we want to protect our doctor-patient confidentiality. For this reason, we are not prepared to divulge beyond that. Um, can we get a, a clarity within my district? And uh, I would say so because I, 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 I think at the end of the day, in as much as um, we must protect uh, the confidentiality between the doctor and the patient, but at the same time, the department must also come to book and uh, understand that 
Uh, learners must be taught. The end of the day, upon arrival, there will be no teachers at school because we are unable to cross this hurdle. Maybe let me just say thank you very much. of monitoring you arrive at a school you find the learners majority outside others are inside you ask a question what is happening they say they just said we must go home we will come another day what is the other day learners do not know parents do not know i th think we need to oil up the issue of communication so that where schools are going to apply a rotational attendance let the oiling machinery of information be, be be well addressed so that we don't get the confusions like it happened yesterday of course there are many schools which oil machinery communication was not up to the scratch Thank you very much, Chairperson, for your patience. Honorable Conneval. Thank you, Chairperson. Morning, colleagues, and thank you for, to the department for the presentations. Chair, my questions are brief. The first thing um, I would like to know is maybe the DG can give us a uh, indication on the percentage of schools that are currently still not uh, ready for reopening. Um, if if a national stats or even per province would re really be appreciated as we only have two grades left to be uh, faced in next week. The other question is on the calendar. I saw that um, we still say matric exams will start on 5th of November. It will be done by the 15th. Yesterday, SAT2 issued a statement saying that they want the matric results to be postponed. I would like what is the reaction to that? Because it seems like just as we settle in our learners, people come and stir and cause us a lot of anxiety, and we can no longer afford that. Um, also, um, as much as I appreciate the national stats per province on uh, COVID-19 uh, results, uh, DG maybe perhaps give us stats specifically to education per province, where how many of our teachers um, have been uh, infected, what the recovery rate was, how many unfortunate uh, deaths related to COVID there was, as well as to the learners. So we can actually see what is happening in the education sector specific. And Chairperson, that uh, masks is, is one example. And because I'm on the ground and, and assist schools with masks wherever we can through donors or personally, um, we were told that two masks per learner or a mask and a shield, as in the presentation as well. But there are only two schools who do not comply. What happened to the um, appliance to the SOPs? What actions are actually taken against schools that does not comply. And I know that uh, uh, pr provinces have got MECs and we are in different spheres of government, autonomy, etc. But that's not good enough in a pandemic. Thank you, Chairperson. You are breaking, Honorable King. Honourable Van der Waals, I'm sorry. Uh, we Jay, missed uh, did you the, not last, hear my the last part. 
Can you can you just repeat your last what you wrote? Okay, sure. I will chair. Am I audible now? Yes, audible. yes. My question is, uh, Chair, despite the fact that we have MECs and autonomy at provincial level, what or specific individuals do not abide by the COVID-19 protocols and or the SOPs? Because there is just too much. Like if we say two masks, some gets one mask. If we uh, say, you know, schools must be prepared, uh, some schools do nothing to prepare. So my, my real question is what action are taken when there's no compliance? Thank you, Chairperson. Honorable at once. Thank you, thank you, Honorable Chair, and greetings to all the honorable members and uh, uh, team of the department led by the DM. Uh, Chair, I was struggling to uh, log in during uh, the apology of uh, Honorable Malachi. He's not uh, feeling well. So that, that, uh, <clears throat> Apology be noted. Uh, I couldn't do it within the, the time of apologies. Right, Chairperson, um, when it comes to the presentation, let me also this difficult uh, circumstances that we are faced with. Uh, I don't really have a on the slides that uh, speaks about the 76 days of uh, that is left for, for teaching and learning that uh, it is uh, perceived to end on or conclude on the 15th of December. I would anticipate that the department would have other plans beyond the 76 days because of options uh, that uh, also that led for the schools to be closed for about the, the entire month. Uh, the uncertainties of um, the COVID virus uh, cases in schools that will uh, disrupt uh, schools uh, teaching and learning. in the school. Uh, obviously, it will impact on the 76 days. So um, I just anticipate that the department should have planned beyond the 76 days. Uh, one other thing, Chairperson, I think uh, we should also uh, be mindful about is that uh, we are living with the, the enemy that is uh, not visible, the enemy that uh, we do not, not know when it's going to, 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 to leave us because uh, we're, we're now trying to adjust and, and, and pick up where, where we left off as and when the levels have been less, uh, lessened and all loosened down uh, as we are now in level two. The economy has been opened and many parents have to go back to work and the schools are, are the only hope for, for, their, for their children. So my comment is that uh, there's a need of a, a continuous monitoring and support, support from parents to their children, support uh, from the department to the teachers and all that. So if you can intensify the monitoring of uh, the work that has been done at the school level, if we can intensify the support uh, that will be needed uh, both by learners and teachers, I think that will also ease the stress and anxiety that we, we all live with. Uh, it is not only uh, experienced by, by those learners and teachers, but us as, as leaders and 
also this is and, and try to know, live under this uh, abnormal circumstances chair but chair i think uh, with all that has been said with the challenges that uh, are faced by the department by the schools and also by the communities you would have uh, schools or even communities that there are no uh, water that will rely on uh, going to those schools when the water are being supplied to to, to also use the same uh, resources i think when we are faced with such uh, challenges we must also involve uh, the other departments uh, other stakeholders to also come on board uh, to make sure that uh, we have workable solutions we are not going just to sit down and complain when we know that it's not only the responsibility of the department, it is the responsibility of all of us as leaders, as, as communities, as, as parents, that we need to also uh, assist in making sure that uh, we provide in the future. And also, uh, this year will also be a challenge to those learners because uh, they will have to live with the stigma if we're not uh, careful. They'll have to live with the stigma of the coronavirus uh, learners that never actually got uh, enough uh, education. So I'm, I'm actually commanding the, the department for trying by all means to make sure that that doesn't happen. Uh, you might look at uh, the present uh, and not even thinking about the future but at least there is somebody who is actually looking and uh, for for all the possibilities just such stigma, uh, stigma in in future uh, thank you very much uh, chairperson for for the opportunity and thank Thank you very much uh, to the department and uh, and uh, led by the DM and the DG for holding the fort and, and trying by all means to make sure that uh, uh, even with so many criticism, you are trying by all means to make sure that our learners get uh, education. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Advance. Um Probably also let me just uh, commend uh, the department uh, led by the by the minister, deputy minister, and, and the DG. Um, it was not easy. I believe it was not really easy for yourselves. There was a um, a time where there was uh, even an attack, you know, by your unions and everybody and. People did not understand why the the kids must go back to school, and you 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 were firm. You took um, decisions, and in our view, that is um, that that's what leadership is. Um, we don't lead only when it's um, when it's nice. The pandemic, the reality is that it has hated all of us very badly. Um, it has hit families very badly, and of course, there was no way it was going to leave the education sector and not hit the education sector. But you have managed um, against all odds um, to lead, and uh, we are grateful that um, at least a number of kids now are back uh, in the classroom. They are getting education, and um, we should be we should be grateful. Uh, that has that is that is happened um, the pandemic is still there there will be glitches but um, I'm sure it's glitches that will be able to be to be managed the the, the only issue that I want to to get clarity on um, is the issue of your your quintile four and five schools where you have um, the, 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 the 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 fee paying schools um the kids have not been attending uh, to school now i remember this issue was raised at some point and 
actually the minister was begging parents that um, they must continue paying schools and she gave she gave i mean the reasons of 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 that why she is asking that parents must must pay schools but the understanding is that many parents did not really adhere to that they did not pay the school fees because they felt that um their children are are not at school they are at home therefore they won't be able to pay to pay schools but besides that we all know that many families have been really um jobs um which made uh, probably to many parents not to be able to to pay school fees and as kids now are returning back to schools will then then be allowed to continue and pay for the remaining months or should they start paying again from 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 march or april when they when they um when when they left um, uh, school so i just need clarity on on that one and there are there are issues and i think the minister have um, have have spoke about it last week there are issues that come here and we always emphasize there are issues that came from from honorable members uh, that in my view are issues that can be telephonically be resolved uh, between the department and the, and the members um, i don't think uh, the minister the dm or even the dg for that matter would have a problem in answering a, min a member on any question that uh, that is raised for instance the issues of um, individual people that must get their pensions and so on. I think really those issues does not necessarily have to come to um, a portfolio committee. It's a it's a it's a, it's a matter uh, that can be raised telephonically and be resolved. Um, not unless uh, we get a sense probably that um, the department or the DG is not uh, is not really. Um, responding to members when when they when they when they speak to him, um, then it's something that we can for to lead the the responses. Um, I believe that uh, uh, it's quite number. Um, we've got um, quite some some number of presentations. So we would ask you to to lead then the the the, the responses and, and section. Uh, DN. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, if I can just come on Honorable Adon's comments that uh, as the department we are faced with uh, responsibilities which will need other departments to come in. And as education, there are things that you will need the Department of Water and Sanitation. You will need a SALGA. You will need municipalities because you you build a school in a community where the community does not have water and the community does not have electricity but the school must have these things and the core business education is not to put electricity in an area is to on the broadband you will need the department of communications on the scholar transport, you'll work with the Department of Transport. But if anything goes wrong in all this, which are a core business of other departments, basic education, if anything goes wrong in schooling and education, which is a service provided by other sister departments, the Department of Education cannot push a blame and say, no, it's not us because we are one cooperative, uh, integrated government. So, but it's a, it's a fact that sometimes that which 
is not a core business to another department, they may not put priority, but in that other department, that's not a key priority. That's the, the predicament we sometimes find ourselves in. So on the issue that, uh, Chair, you say Minister has spoken about it, your quintile four and five and independent schools, uh, the schools depend on parents to pay school fees. But it, now in this uh, holiday that we had of four weeks, schools are on, it was just a holiday. So it, any parent, they know they must pay. That's why we felt that learners should not stay at home. They must come to school for learning and also sustaining some of uh, the schools, like your independent schools, private schools. It provides sufficient schools in an area. So the private school or independent school uh, is supporting the work of government. So it's the interest of government to make sure that those private schools are sustainable and they don't die. That's why they were allowed to close schools when publics were attending. Then independent schools took that break before. Then when this second break, which uh, the break of the month of uh, July, August was taken by public schools. We felt that it would be unfair to independent schools because they had taken a break. They were from a break that Monday when public schools learners were at home. So we agreed that no, let them continue because they are from a break. And also that if they take a very long break, we'll encounter that thing that parents may not want to pay because they'll say their children are at home. But what I know is that even if schools are closed, teachers are doing the work. Teachers are doing some work. That's why they are paid even if schools are closed because they have not closed the books. It's only the school that, that uh, is closed. What we were running away was a total shutdown because if there's a total shutdown of a school, then it means parents should not pay school fees. But if it's just a holiday like now or four weeks, parents know. Uh, the calendar of the department has holidays and there was, an, there was never an, a, a time where parents were not paying because there's a school holiday. They pay for all 12 months because they pay per month or per quarter. So they pay for the full year. So even now, parents are paying and are going to pay. We are parents ourselves uh, in some of the quintile four and five schools. Uh, we are paying. So we, that's why minister was encouraging parents to pay because there was work that was taking on even uh, when schools were closed. Chair, I understand on the issue of comorbidities and the, a comorbidity may not, not be a new thing necessarily that now the entire school community is coming back. Because if learners are coming, teachers were always there at school. Those uh, who have underlying con uh, conditions have applied, and those who, whose documentations were authentic were given that uh, 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 approval. So if I just fill a form and submit it without that uh, we want to break the confidentiality, but doctors, they know under the underlying conditions as to which ones can they disclose and which ones can they should they disclose. So let's say I don't want to 
reveal my status, but my doctor knows my status. And the doctor will know exactly what to write uh, on, 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 on the forms. Chair, I don't want to take all the questions. We have brought a team of technocrats, people who are dealing with this work. They will uh, share the questions among themselves. I might come back if I see that there's something that they did not cover because I've written all the questions. I want to give to DG now and DG will share with the colleagues, uh, the relevant colleagues to this one, take this one, then I'll come and, and, and close. Uh, DG, over to you, sir. Through you, Chair. Thank you. Honorable Deputy Minister, Honorable Chair, Honorable Member. Uh, indeed, DM, we will share the speakers almost. Uh, DM has uh, covered some of the questions. Honorable Sukers uh, uh, asked about keeping learners at home. With parents, we agree. And I'm Did you come, come closer, friends. come closer to your mic. You are fading, uh, so come closer to the mic. Thank you. Am I fading, DM? Yes, you are how fading. Is, uh, how is and, this now? And your network Am is not very, your network is not very clear. I don't know what's happening now. now because yeah, yes, yeah. I decided to move to move uh, to a better place, so the better piece is becoming. Um, so I'm saying uh, we will improve on communication. Uh, we will also uh, remove administrative glitches. But what needs to be told is that, that uh, for parents who decide to put their children in their home, they must always remember that... Uh, Can other members ask? By, by just muting their mics, um, the HP and then the PM, those two... Members, can you assist with just muting your mics as well? Because it's really now... As it's difficult to get the DG. Thank you. You can proceed. Oh, okay. let, let me try something else, Chair. I just want to check. Is it better now? Do I come out better or is it still worse? You are perfect now, DG. It's better, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I'm saying there's a joint response. Stability in law, the equality of care, a, a joint and the state, and uh, the the fact that uh, the responsibility of the state uh, should come through, it does not negate the responsibility of the guardian or the parent, especially parents who take the decision to keep their children at home. So if you take that decision. You, you you have to live with the consequences, but the system should not punish you for taking that decision, but rather should the NECT and the consortium on uh, external monitoring and evaluation are going to start giving us uh, more information on health, safety, and social distancing in schools as to how does it uh, uh, happen and whether there is compliance throughout. We are monitoring ourselves, but the NECT and the consortium will give us more information. And thank you for bringing that uh, to our attention, Honorable Sukhir. Uh, and then, learners uh, with special education needs in care centers well, the, the support applies to those learners in the same way as uh, it would apply to 
learners in schools. We, we, we don't disadvantage them by the fact that they are under uh, care centers that uh, responsibility for teaching and therefore uh, our responsibility continues there. Matriculants who are not uh, registered, well, they've got to, if they are not registered, there's another opportunity to write uh, May, June next year. We met, by the way, with the youth I'm sure that uh, learners are not disadvantaged because they are going to get their results uh, later than uh, the other examining bodies such as Africa. We had a meeting um, with um, um, their forum and we spoke about these things. They have assured us that they will not be disadvantaged. We'll be meeting with the other assessment bodies to check whether we can the provision for next year, like uh, Honorable Sirs wanted to know. There is that provision, and uh, so they will be treated. Honorable Machesi, uh, you are asking us what is the value of this risk adjusted approach. Remember, Honorable Machesi, I said we are not out of the woods as yet. Uh, there can be a second wave, but we can even start using it for the outbreaks that are happening in different areas in different provinces where you don't need to close all schools. But what is important, the last slide that I presented gives, gives us lessons of not. 1980. I'm saying we have seen what happened, and we can use this um, even now when the peak uh, has passed, when the infections are going down, where we can even use the, 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 the strategy. And then um, uh, uh, provinces uh, providing support to learners. We collect this information every week. And again, I want to implore you. I know that uh, you'll be patient with me. Next week we'll demonstrate these things, including the support that is provided to learners who are at home. So that information will be provided. Catch-up program. There is a catch-up program, particularly for grade 12 learners, but for the other grades, uh, Dr. Maboya will tell you that they even do di diagnostic assessment uh, for learners to check where they are since they were last in the classroom so that teachers know where to pick them up to move them to the required level. And, and then that schools must stay open, uh, yes, as far as possible. I've shared the uh, international experience that some countries never close schools, and going forward, we must really avoid closing schools. We must only close them when it is necessary to do so. The WHO says if the infections are extremely high, then as part of uh, protecting learners, we must close schools. And I think the risk adjusted approach is really about that to say when schools must remain open and I'm happy that you, you you're supporting that honorable but I think we need to be patient with the whole nation and the, of the science and knowledge about the virus uh, people get to understand and appreciate what we are trying to do. And before that, people didn't want to hear anything because it was anxiety and fear all the way. And I think as we begin to share this data, as we begin to share this information, which we have shared in 
that there is no need to close all schools. Uh, teachers uh, be replaced, particularly for teachers teachers with comorbidities. In the debate, we'll, we'll also share information next week to show how far we have gone. We had 27,000 applications. 22 applications have been approved uh, based on the information that was made available on our Murat If you want us to help you, you have to give us as much information as possible that can afford us to help you. If you are you are reluctant to give the information that is required, that applies to honorable uh, Tendekwayo as well. Unfortunately, Disaster Management Act and check the extent to which that act. The only right that is paramount in terms of disaster management is the right to life. And the right to life seems to trump all other rights, including the right to privacy, Honorable uh, Murotseta. And that's, there's a relevant provision in the disaster management. And these people are reluctant to provide the information that is required, especially with respect to COVID-19. Mr. Padaki, part of the meeting, you can confirm that provinces have been using that, plus unemployed uh, graduate uh, data and all other information that is available. Marking for teachers, um, a teacher will, teachers will not be marking till March because the results will be released on the 22nd and the 23rd of February. So marking will, will be finalized in January, and, and I think, yeah, in January, and then from there it will be standardization up to the release of the results. And then plans for, for uh, you are talking about plans for teaching by all other provinces, and that we can share with you again next week we're intensive and we'll cover that. Honorable King, uh, schools that could not uh, reopen, we meet every day at 6 o'clock in the morning and sanitation. All nine provinces for the past uh, four weeks or so gave us um, a guarantee that there'll be no school that will not be able to open because of those. Schools that will not be able to open due to health and structural challenges, uh, provinces have not indicated that uh, to us at all. But we're starting to meet with them again. Information for you. PEDs which uh, still need teachers, uh, yes, yes, indeed, not all of them have been able to replace teachers with comorbidities. I've just indicated that we have 27,000 applications, 22,000 were approved, but not all of them have been replaced. But also, I need to bring to your attention that. Uh, the DPSA is developing a remote uh, work policy and risk environment compared to the health environment. Education is medium risk, and many of these teachers with comorbidities might be required to go back to work once the framework is agreed and taken through the relevant campus and so on. Registration for home education, the turnaround time, it should be 30 days. It's on our website. We have to do that. And as the Honorable Chair indicated, if there are problems, please bring them to our attention. If there are delays, uh, we'll intervene and uh, try to assist. Whether there are delays, I've been talking about four to five months. It shouldn't happen. 
The turnaround time that we put on our website is 30 days. The Elsa and Lena's uh, Blind SA, well, we've got uh, organizations representing uh, 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 people and learners with disabilities in the basic education sector. The PASA is one of them, and, uh, and I've forgotten the name of the other one. We meet with them regularly, virtually every week, and there are no issues from them. And uh, DIPASA is an organization representing school principals for learners with special education needs. There's a, call, a lady called Michelle. Here I will recall that uh, the lady speaks in every meeting, and they are well represented there. And uh, as, as Senase, Senase is an organization in basic education representing learners with special education needs. And therefore, even blind learners are represented today. So we do meet sometimes with blind SA, so we'll follow up as to what are the issues that they are not happy about. Um, the breakdown of uh, support that we provide to schools, again, and we'll give you a comprehensive report the province next week on the 1st. Uh, Dr. Mabuya will re respond to that around electives and fundamentals for grade 11 learners that they are not compromised when they go to grade 12. I'll leave it for Dr. Mabuya to comment on it. Uh, we are dealing with uh, the uh, quality and quantity of confidential in our one-on-one -on -one meetings and we'll also give you an update on what we are presenting on the first on that one. That would apply to sanitizers, disinfectants, masks, the number of masks, Honorable Van der Waard, we are also following that in our report. And I'm sure you'll consider a monkey valley. I had you speaking to the minister last week about the possibility of getting all of us under one roof uh, to come and explain and account to you about some of these things. The directives, uh, uh, to suppliers, well, Mr. Kuno will tell you that there are, there are specifications that are issued by National Treasury. Those are the, the directives that are given to all suppliers who are supplying us with to present to you to put all of these things that you have raised uh, to bed including directives issued by the minister, communication that I had with HODs in provinces, to also give you information on how all provinces responded to the structural interdict uh, that we are implementing. We are ready to, to make that presentation to you if you allow us to do that. Honorable Machiavella, uh, prepare have addressed that already. yesterday we have we have addressed the matter support to learners uh, who schools could, could not uh, pick uh, allowing parents and the, and the media to come and conduct inspections in schools would love to do that but the problem that we have is that experts are saying they are going to increase the risk for infections in schools. We are very strict on the number of visits to schools because we don't want to open up learners for possible infections from people who come uh, under the notion of inspection or uh, verifying what is happening in schools. Uh, the reasons for allowing private schools to uh, to open while public schools went on a break. We have explained this before. It has never happened in the history of this country that uh, all private schools go on breaks the same time with public schools. Some do. Some have a different uh, calendar, and it's purely based on that and nothing else. Deviation on uh, uh, allowing grades to return, it applies to all schools, not only some schools, not only Western Cape, and we'll give you information next week 
to show that it was not only Western Cape that applied deviation, even other provinces applied that. It's not only private schools. More public schools apply deviation more than private schools. We'll give you that information next week. Honorable Boshoff, uh, 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 I'll ask Mrs. Gaya just to explain that has provided more days for teaching and learning. Maybe one. What uh, Ms. Gaya can explain is what uh, Honorable Murat Seta has also raised. I think we needed less than 50 days, and we worked out about 56 or 57 more days that were added uh, to, be, to afford, you know, grades. But usually what happens, learners will leave first and teachers and the school management team would leave later. Honorable Tetembe Kwayo, uh, teachers with comorbidities have explained that if teachers need to be helped, they must provide the information that uh, is required. Otherwise, they won't get the help that uh, they need. Uh, the issue of 10 million, this is the other 3 million, when referring to the number of It's in the Gazette. The Gazette says grade 8 and grade 5 and other levels for schools of skill will only come on the 31st of, of August. That is according to the phase in uh, program. That is in the Gazette. Uh, curriculum training, uh, continuous disruption, and I think you've given a very interesting postulation there that Dr. Maboya could consider the no road. I think think is the low, medium, and high road. So you are proposing the low road. I'll leave it to Dr. Maboya uh, to look at that, whether there's a possibility to fit in the no road where there is no teaching and learning at all. Home education and deregistration de 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 of learners. Um, well, if learners are deregistered, then it is school after a certain period, I think it's about 20 days, if I'm not mistaken, they are automatically deregistered. De and Ms. Gaya can just confirm that. Screeners, there are screeners who are appointed by the department. There are screeners who are appointed by the department of uh, local government through a uh, community development uh, a work program. And there are those who are appointed through the the public work program. It depends if they tell you through which program they appointed. I am aware that some provinces delayed in paying screeners and cleaners. And so we can take that up on your behalf. We are not as quick as you want us to be uh, sometime. But we do our best. Issues of pensions, we have helped many. Uh, and I must say that uh, some of these cases take long, and if you have uh, given us this information, we'll continue to follow up and, and, and make sure that uh, 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 people who have their pension benefits outstanding are happy there. They used to apply for the Solidarity Fund, and we can give them information in this regard and try uh, to get them information on how to apply for assistance from the Solidarity Fund. Honorable Murat Seka, thank you for your for your comments. Uh, the school calendar, Ms. Gaya, will just uh, provide specifics that you require, uh, I mean, requested for. About uh, the 15th of December, who leaves first and uh, last and so on. Uh, teachers with comorbidities and substitute uh, teachers have spoken to this. This applies to information that is required as well. I've also spoken to it. Um, information, uh, yeah, the issue of confidentiality, I've also. Thank you about this. 
Um, and honorable, I think it's honorable Founder Bart, percentage of schools that were not ready to open have indicated that we don't have any school that was not ready to open, but we will collect information this week. Next week on the first, if we don't address this, it has to come back, but I'll keep it at the back of my mind. The, the issue of the calendar and the NFC timetable and statement, all that I can say is that the NFC timetable has been approved by CEM, and that's the timetable that we are following at the moment. Steps of the and it's also going to be part of the presentation next week, Honorable Van der Waal. I put my head on the block, will give you steps for it. Cater, non-teaching staff, learners, every in cases of fatalities, if I don't, I will humbly submit my resignation and say I have failed you, Honorable. What we have is for last week, include even new grades uh, that have reported. Uh, action where there is no compliance in terms of COVID essentials, the normal disciplinary process would ensue in this regard, whether you are a school principal, whether you are a district official, provincial, or an national official, bring this to our attention where learners are not provided with tools. For everyone to know that it's a requirement that we are expected to meet. If we have not met that requirement, please bring it to our attention. I know that you do that, Honorable Honorable. Honorable Adjuns, thank you for your, your comments, and, and thank you for inspiring for your comments, uh, DM responded to the issue of school fees, and I must just add that the issue of the school fees is decided uh, for fee paying schools in a parent meeting. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's the, it's the responsibility of the school and the parent to discuss that in a parent meeting to discuss what portion. I'm going to request Dr. Maboya and maybe uh, Ms. Gaya and uh, Mr. Parayaki just to add, if you allow, uh, Honorable Deputy Minister and Honorable Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Honorable Chair. Uh, I will respond just to indicate that uh, we really appreciate uh, the comments that were made around this and uh, with regard to the no road and low road uh, 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 chair our view is that uh, the no road is actually part of the low road because remember the low road that's where we are saying that schools would have lost 60 percent and more of the teaching time. So our belief is that where there is 100% loss of uh, teaching time, which is actually unlikely because there was some teaching that took place in quarter one. So we are saying that uh, your no road is actually already uh, accommodated in that uh, scenario. And I think what is also important to mention here with regard to the scenarios is the fact that the main objective is to make it a point that schools are able to identify the risks as early as possible. And they also come up with the measures to mitigate those and being able to manage that. On the issue of the support for grade uh, 11s, uh, uh, Honorable Chair, what we can say is that uh, 
application of uh, the key competencies for 2021. Be mindful of the fact that the current grade 11s will be our uh, metric uh, cohort of 2021. We are doing everything in our power to ensure that uh, we identify those competencies that have to be uh, covered. But what we are also saying in terms of, uh, because of uh, the importance of the grade 11, it's not that other grades are not important. We, what we have also said is that whilst for all the other grades, we are saying for promotional purposes, provisions for schools to actually even go beyond the class tests and uh, perhaps administer fully fleshed ex examinations for those subjects that are designated as um, uh, fundamentals. These subjects would be the languages as well as mathematics or uh, math lit. And we are saying that that is how, how we want really to prioritize the grade 11s for the mere fact that the grade 11s in no time will be our grade 12s of 2021. Uh, DG, I think I've been able to respond to uh, the issues that you wanted me to speak to. Thank you. Am I still Mrs. audible? Gaya. I hope I'm not. Mrs. Gaya. Yes, CG. Um, I'll come in on the calendar. Um, honorable members, uh, the issue on the calendar in terms of the explanation that that we maximize the in the remaining 16 weeks that we have, we maximize on the most of teaching time that we could possibly do in order to um, ensure that we cover the curriculum that uh, based on the term curriculum that needs to be covered we cover that and so um, the, the that's why the closure of the school date is pushed back to the 15th of December to accommodate for that now the schools um, normally work out the school time the school exam timetable and uh, for the lower grades and um, what is what will happen in this instance is that, um, as DG has explained, the learners will leave about three days before uh, the school closes, and then the teachers will use that three days to uh, complete the the um, report cards. And on the fifteenth, when the school closes, that is the day when the learners go back to school to go fetch the report cards and they receive it and then the school closes for all the learners and all the teachers on that day. So there will be a period where learners would be at home for about three days. So um, before the, 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 they go back to the school. And this arrangement is not unique to this year. It has back to school. Normally they close on the end of November and then the first three days in December uh, they are at home and go back again to school to go and fetch the report cards. This year the difference is that they will be going later. They will go three days before that so that they um, maximize on the best of time to cover the curriculum and the teaching time and address the issues. Thank you. Thank you, DG, Mr. Padiachi. Yeah. <coughs> on the core mobilities, just an honorable chair to indicate that uh, in terms of the agreement, these are people who are not sick. They do have a mobility or two or even more, and that it's not considered leave. And that is why uh, uh, we ex there's expectation that they can be worked on. And uh, 
The issue is that basically if they did become infected, their uh, exposure would be more severe because of the comorbidities that they, are, they, are, they have had. And as the DG had indicated with the DPSA framework, uh, it would mean that these need to be managed. If it's managed, you would need to report for work. And the Department of Health. So in certain instances, there are people who have applied that's outside this list. However, provincial departments have uh, taken these applications to the health risk manager or the medical practitioner. So we've taken a bit of a lenient approach in that respect. But just applying doesn't mean that you will be uh, granted the concession. And that, I think, is a misunderstanding that people need to accept, that whether it's a principal or the district manager, they need to apply their mind based on what's in front of them. Uh, the other is that if there's disagreement and it's rejected, the employee has the right to declare a dispute uh, and there's processes that are set out in terms of taking that forward. And obviously it helps if the doctor of the employee is able to give more information subject to the confidentiality because that can be shared with the medical practitioner that the department, the provincial department is utilizing. So the HR personnel do not need to, have, they will be advised by the department's uh, medical practitioner. Now, yes, this information means that a concession should be granted. The other is that uh, what we found is that, uh, interestingly, when the concession was introduced in June, many people who were above 60 were about to retire. Many started to withdraw the applications as well. Although we find that there are others who, even though they qualify, have decided to retire for life. In certain instances, yes, you need a replacement because it's a great 12. It's a key subject. It could be in the foundation phase where you replace. One of the reasons that we do not feel pressure before this is because we had fewer grades. This will now. <coughs> change, but that's also dependent on a number of variables. Some of the schools will not have all their learners back because of the reasons that parents have taken. So in those instances, there would still be a possibility that they could rearrange how the teaching arrangement would happen. But there are certain instances that you will need to employ a substitute as a full body. Some uh, We've introduced what we call an education assistant. That's not to replace a teacher but to be uh, the link between a teacher working from home and that which is with the learners in the class. So the one province has already employed 800 uh, young people in that respect. Uh, and in the, interestingly, we found that now we're getting applications for the uh, markers, for the metric exam, from these educators who have a concession. So it's now deemed un not unsafe to basically go to the marking center. So that I think the colleagues in exams are dealing with, also considering our legal opinion. We've also had reports of some of these educators find it safe to, uh, that it's no longer unsafe to go to the mall, but the school is uh, really dangerous. And the other thing about the substitutes that has forced us to look at this again is that no person older than 60 can be a substitute. And, and they will also have to provide a medical report to indicate that they have no comorbidities. And that's to prevent us from having a substitute for the substitute. And because if we had a like-for-like -like employment, which is also referred to as double parking when you're referring to educators who are additional, this will cost us over six billion uh, in terms of over a six month period, uh, which is not in the fiscus. And the other is that there is pressure to deal with the compensation of employees in the public service in general, not just uh, education itself. So I think uh, looking at the comorbidities itself, uh, we have, there's not just the issue of staying at home. It's also about the workplace being arranged in such a way that it is safe. And in a sense, June, we found that there's a number of innovations in this regard. There are a large number of uh, educators who are above 60, especially those who are principals, who have continued to work uh, due to their passion itself over 40,000 uh, educators that are on our database with the provinces. They own nine big databases that they have. We also issued an advert on the 16th of July. We had over 10, 15,000 applications. 
and these could uh, are including qualified teachers and, and those who are professionally qualified but not uh, qualified as a teacher who have lost their job due to the COVID uh, from the private sector. So there is uh, those sources in order to deal with the replacements. And to answer the Honorable Member's questions regarding to provide information with respect to Funza Lushaka, uh, we had, uh, you know, since uh, 2014, uh, we've had over 21,000 that had, graduated, had been uh, available to us. We had placed over 19,000 of them. And so when we started the year off, there were these, over the last previous five years, there were 2,500. And what we found in July is that uh, provinces have taken on the opportunity, not just for the reason of comorbidities, there's always a need for replacements because teachers do get sick and there are vacancies in the system as well. So 1,114 uh, 1, 1, of them have been placed. So we have that group of 1,387 available. And from the cohort that graduated in 2019, there were 4,294 who were eligible for placement. Uh, by June, we had placed uh, under 60%. That's 2,551. So there's a 1,743. We also have about 4,500 who are in their final year at uh, higher education institutions now. They will be going out for their teaching practice as well in September and October. So that could be of assistance to provide relief for provincial departments to manage uh, both the placement uh, at schools as well as their budgets, uh, human resource budgets as well. Thank you, DJ. Thank you, Honorable Minister and Honorable Chair. We are done. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we are done. Okay, thank you very much, DM, DG, and the and the and the officials from the department. Um, honourable members, those are the other responses. I think that at least we are now at par. What are the plans of the department moving forward? Um, how are they going to conclude um, this difficult 2020? Um, we, we are managed now. We are at the at the at the level where we are able to to understand how are they going to 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 close the year. Um, are we are we are we all fine? Uh, we don't have time anyway. Um, I think then uh, let's let's thank you very much, DM and uh, DG and all the, the officials from the department for your time. Uh, um, we can allow you now to, to leave as we are about to, um, to adopt the minutes. Bye. And bye bye. We also have got a, a sitting at two. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Brown. Um, members, we are the 18th of um, August, we were having a briefing by the by DBE on their fourth quarterly report performance on for 2019-2020. You've got uh, members who attended the meeting, and then you've got officials that attended the meeting, and also the parliamentary staff. We welcomed the minister and the DM and the officials from the department. And then um, we have alluded uh, on the agenda as well as for members of the committee. And then we asked the minister to clarify the issues of, of matter of, of public, um, I mean, of, of national importance.
portals that are on the public domain. And then we had an address by the by the minister, and after that we had a briefing which was led by the DG Mueni, and then um, he they've outlined they, they've outlined the the quota form presentation, and then after that we adopt we 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 adopted the minutes of the 14th of July. Um, and then um, on matters arising, we raised the issues of oversight and the agreement thereof with the House Chair, and then the, the meeting adjourned at 2036. Um, any corrections on the minutes? Uh, sorry, Chairperson, so, can, can, I, can, can, I, can you go to page one? I think it's page one, please. Okay. Can you can you take us to page one? Can can you write my credentials well? And I, I think I'm commenting about this for the second time. I, I am a doctor, please. Like you do with all other guests or, or whoever is present here on the next page. Can 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 I be acknowledged of my qualifications, please? Uh, that is that is corrected. Apologies, uh, Honourable Dr. Tembequayo. That is that is corrected. Any other um, correction? Okay. I take it that then we agree that the the minutes are a true reflection of what transpired in the in the meeting. Um, can I get a mover and a seconder? I move chair for okay. adoption, Honorable Kavalala. Honorable Kavalala, thank you very much, Ma. Yeah. Any second? Seconded by Murat <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dadim uh, Fundis, Murat The principal. The Fundis is. You must call my first. You must you must call my title well the principal. <laughs> you are in as well. What is wrong? <laughs> okay, members. Then we came to um, we came to a conclusion of our meeting. Um, the next meeting that we are going to have it's gonna be next week on Tuesday. The details will be sent to your to yourselves. And um, all the best to the members that are debating this afternoon. Um, thank you very much. The meeting is adjourned. Bye-bye.